Hello and welcome to a presentation of my documentary work with the uh, Gori uh, Hindu sect. Um, this presentation, this slideshow, was first given in Treadwell's Bookshop in London. Um, I've had a number of people ask me to do the presentation again, so I thought the best opportunity would be to upload it here to YouTube. So all the photographs in this presentation are my own, uh, from my own uh, time following the Agori. Uh, in Varanasi. I suppose a good place to start is to um, show you some photographs of Varanasi and kind of put some context around the work. Um, Varanasi is also known as Benares or Kashi. Uh, it's an ancient city on the banks of the Ganges in the northern Indian province of Uttar Pradesh. Pretty much it's the spiritual capital of India. Uh, what you're looking at here is Dash Ashwamada Ghat uh, where um, Priests daily put on a, a, a Angi Puja, which is worship to fire, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, this is a dedication made to Lord Shiva, the river Ganges, uh, Surya, the sun, and Angi fire, and to the whole universe. Um, it, it's pretty much kind of a, a, a ceremony or prayer for world peace. The city is known worldwide for its many ghats and embankment, which are embankments made of st stone steps that go into the riverbank. Um, any photographs you've seen of cremations in India or people taking a bath in, in the water, um, that's generally Varanasi. That's it's very old. Uh, according to the legend, Varanasi was founded by the god Shiva. The Pandavas, the mythic heroes of the Hindu epic Mahabharata, are said to have visited the city. Um, archaeological evidence um, suggests the earliest known settlements in, in the vicinity of Varanasi uh, begin around 2000 BC. And this place is Varanasi as being uh, amongst the oldest continually inhabited cities um, in, in the world. So who are the Agori? The Agori are Shivite sect um, living in and around the spiritual capital of India. They already discussed Varanasi. They are followers of the spiritual practice of Adgore Sadhana, that which is used to achieve Adgore Swahar. They are monists um, who, who seek Moshka. Um, or release from the cycle of reincarnation or samsara. It's not inherently bound to Hinduism. It cannot be constrained within the boundaries of either Shivaism or, say, another cult like Shakti, cult of Shakti. Um, this, there's no fixed rules. So it's it's a state of mind um, where an individual kind of resigns himself to Shiva. The name Agori comes from Agora, which roughly translates that which is not Gora, Fierce, that which is not difficult or complex. Another variant of the translation, which probably makes a lot more sense um, when you see the Agori, is an absence of fear or dread. The goal is to have transcended material cravings and boundaries for the attainment of the true meaning and purpose of life. The Agori maintain that all opposites are ultimately illusory. I've often met Agori who were members of other sects or, or, or sadhus from other sects who practice at Gaur Sadhana. While you have to be initiated, there there is definitely a lot of fluidity with the rules. It's worth orientating the Western occultist. These sadhus are practicing a left-hand path. Their rituals are very much of that ilk. It must be said that the desired outcome of these rituals is not necessarily a dark one. So it's a left-hand path or Vamkara. As, uh, as indicated here. So conventional Hindu philosophies are quite at odds with the Agoris in general. The sect practices customs which are seen as quite abhorrent to mainstream Hinduism. They sleep on corpses, they regularly cover themselves in the ashes of the, of the recently cremated, and use human skulls as vessels for food and drink. They've been known to consume human flesh and human waste, and use alcohol and drugs as part of their religious practice. A term that I really liked when I heard there is that they are God, God possessed, or God crazy. They call this transcending of boundaries, non-discrimination. And I found an Alistair Crowley quote which I felt was quite appropriate for the Agori. And that quote is, ordinary morality is only for ordinary people. It's difficult to uh, reconstruct uh, the Agori's origin uh, as it only really exists in quotations of critics and observers. The Agoris didn't leave any text or chronicles for us to track their history. But what we do know is it's believed Shiva is their original founder. The actual origin is unknown. 
The order, or at least documented practitioners, is said to have been dormant since the 5th or 6th century BC. Baba Kinaram founded the present practice and Kremkund in the 16th century. Here he reignited the Akand Duni, or eternal fire. Um, there's a quote here from Agor at a glance, which indicates the divine um, essence of Baba Kinaram. In the 16th century, Sada Shiva, an avatar of Shiva, was forced to adopt the human form made of the five elements for the sake of human welfare. He took the form and name of Baba Kinaram. The picture here is of uh, one of the pillars outside the main gate of um, Krem Kund, the, uh, the main Agori Ashram, um, which is three skulls stacked on a Shiva trident, and I'll explain them at a later date. The principle of non-discrimination. They believe that nothing is blasphemous or independent of, from God, that there is no difference between the profound and the profane. The logic behind how they pursue their beliefs is the idea that all paths lead to divine no matter how extreme. That route to the universal truth is a path of non-discrimination. To become indifferent to eating habits, taboos, physical appearance is to progress on the path of non-discrimination. Everything is but different manifestations of the same supreme power. The realization of this is the zenith of the Agori state of consciousness. They achieve this through Adgore Sadhana, a process of unlearning deeply internalized cultural models. The man in this photograph is Siri Baba Nagnath Yogeshwar, um, who will feature quite heavily in the photographs to come. He's uh, an Agore based right on the main burning gas in Varanasi. The skull. The skull is the key symbol of the Agori and, the, and its skull based rituals are, are most associated with the Agori. Um, and you, you see the symbol again and again where the Agori are related to any institution or individual. Kapalas or skull cups which Shiva and other Hindu deities are often depicted holding or using one. The skull mirrors our actual state. The beauty made of skin and flesh sets to rot, but the skull or skeleton is immortal like the self. It is also the home of prana, and in that the home of the invisible power that sustains the universe. Hermits who wish to be left alone need a good prop. Now this last point is referenced to a conversation I had with Dr. Ashok Kumar, director of the Agor Research Institute. Um, when I asked about the skull and what it, what it symbolized, but also what its true esoteric meaning was. And he spoke about uh, it being a source of prana, it's been a source of meditation, a focus point for meditating on um, our true state. But he also said it was a useful prop because it kept people away. It allowed the Agor to focus on his spiritual path, his spiritual thinking um, and ambitions without being constantly disturbed because people were in fact terrified of him because he was carrying around a human skull. It's a reasonably common practice. So in India and Tibet, the skull cup is known as the Kapala and used in Buddhist tantric and Hindu tantric rituals. Accomplishment of necrosis. Part of this path includes Shabha Sadhana, or accomplishment of necrosis. Now that's not the literal translation of that. Uh, sadhana literally means accomplishing, a means of accomplish, accomplishing something. Uh, Shabha means corpse. This is referring to the practice of meditating on a corpse. It's about exploring and touching the ultimate human fear, death, our own deaths to be specific, and the horror and taboo of, it, of a dead body. Sitting on top of a corpse, realizing that dying is the supreme truth and that all of us have to go through it alone. From a yogic or tantric point of view, it signifies attachment from the physical world. So Shabha Sadhana is regarded as one of Tantra's most difficult, most important, and of course, most secret rituals. Tantric texts, as well as oral tales, detail the process of the ritual and also tell of its importance. The purpose of practicing the ritual range from knowledge, propriety to a deity, material motives, even dark objectives to gaining control of the spirit of the deceased. And incidentally, the skulls you're seeing in the picture, the sandalwood yellow and the red on top of it indicate that something is being trapped inside the skull so the agori who uses these skulls is using this practice to to gain control of the spirit of the deceased it's practiced in a graveyard on a new moon 
the sadhaka, the one meditating, is supposed to go through rigid rituals and then sit on top of the corpse all night, meditating all alone. And not any corpse, it has to be a fresh, complete and unharmed corpse. So through doing something shocking, you have to you set yourself free from the shackles of society and its morality and its religion. And that refers, that kind of really um, hammers home the message of how this is a process of, of deprogramming, of freeing you from convention, which is what I believe the Agori are, are truly doing. The next set of photographs uh, are of Siri Baba Nagnath Yogeshwar on the Manikari Nikita Ghat. So the Ghat itself is in, in constant motion. It, it, at any given time, there are a dozen cremations in progress. Wood pyres are piled high, and there's the jarring appearances of human feet and arms and heads sticking out of piles of burning logs. Now, to take photographs of this particular Ghat is extraordinarily difficult. You would generally get in a lot of trouble uh, and get accosted by um, the, the people uh, well, the families there or the doms managing the, the, the cremations. And there's a lot of hustling that goes on. Hence, I wasn't able to do so. And in fact, I pretty much got threatened with, <laughs> got threatened quite clearly. Um, if I tried to take any photographs or indeed if I came back, I would be, um, I would be in a, 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 some danger. I uh, basically, I was trying to be stabbed, um, but these things happen. Um, this is Sri Baba Nagath Yogeshwar, the leading Aghori uh, Sadhu aesthetic in Varanasi. His temple is right on the Burning Ghat. It's, it's absolutely dead centre to, to the Burning Ghat, which is really a, a, an indication of how spiritually important this man is, is, is seen to be. If you can imagine, the most sacred place to be burnt in the entirety of India is in Varanasi on the banks of the Ganges. And this particular Ghat is the most sacred one of all. And his temple is right on it. So right here we, hear, we see a sacred fire and a collection of Shiva tridents. Directly behind me, um, as I was taking this photograph, is the burning Ghat. Here is Yamraja, the Lord of Death, in a garland of marigold flowers. Um, Flower garlands are very important parts of puja, uh, which is worship, both in, both at home and in temples. You're unlikely to find an image of a god at any altar without flowers. Um, in fact, the word puja is derived from the Dravidian word pu, which means uh, flowers. Uh, that's pu with a pu. Here is a linga and a yoni. The, the lingam uh, is an abstract or an iconic a representation of Shiva used for worship. The, un the union of the Linga and the Yoni represents the indivisible two and oneness of the male and female form. As an aside, these uh, these sacred stones turn up in England too. In the Roots of Witchcraft uh, by William Harrison, it uh, details stone lingams were found in English churches from the 11th and 12th century. The partial deconstruction of these buildings by German bombs during World War II uh, led a gentleman by the name of Professor Webb was an expert in medieval art church architecture to an investigation that has ascertained 90% of all medieval English churches, which he had examined, had an interior, had in the interiority of the altars, a stone lingam. So there's some evidence there to suggest that there was some kind of old core belief systems that came out of India and migrated across uh, across Europe. Um, so under this pile of, uh, of flowers is Vasuki, and he is uh, a Nagaraja. Uh, one of the king serpents of the Hindu mythology and Buddhist mythology. He is a king of the Nagas and has a gem in his head called Nagamani. Vasuki is Shiva's snake and there is another lingam stone in the pit beneath the, the statue. This uh, famous lady is Kali, of course, with a garland of heads and a skirt of hands. She is the start and the end of the world. And we are famously now in, in the age of Kali. We're in the Kali Yoga, the age where time itself will be destroyed. Photograph of Shiva's trident. So here are my guides paying my, their respects. They truly believed him to be powerful. Uh, you might notice some deformation on his shoulders here. I'll go on to explain that when it becomes a little bit clearer in later photographs. This is Vasuki again from the back. Some bells for Puja. And in the back here you can see uh, there is a, a linga, Shiva linga in the back there with the snake wrapped around the, the, the lingam stone and a Shiva trident. 
more of the bells. You can see the bit of the bell is, is actually highly polished from the amount of times it's been touched. When people pray, they, they ring the bell. So Siri Baba Nagnath Yogeshwar is an aesthetic. He has not bent his arms for in 17 years and is alleged not to have eaten food for seven years, existing solely on, on water. This aesthetic devotion has deformed his body and his shoulders and elbows are locked in place, holding his arms at 45 degree angles from his body. And you can see this around the shoulders. So his arms are, are pretty much fused in place now. One of the Baba's followers here is preparing a simple meal for him of crushed lentils. And here is uh, Shiva himself with a garland of skulls and a gory symbols. Shiva is the, is the god of, of destruction as well as creation, which is a perpetual cyclical movement uh, of one following the other. Here his body is covered in ashes, symbolic of death and regeneration. Shiva is always nearly it, she, she was always nearly naked, which symbolizes his primal condition, his non-attachment to the world. His body shows feminine characteristics like soft rounded contours or sometimes no beard, uh, which is symbolic of his transcendent of opposites, the primal unity of polarities. With half closed eyes, he's immersed in, in meditation here in, in his divine bliss. The Ganges springs from his for from his from his head. From his long hair. The crescent moon, the new moon, is Shiva's moon, is on his forehead, the cobra around his neck, and the white bull Nandi is here behind him, and the Ganges is behind him, along with the city of Varanasi. All of these form a symbolic cluster which indicates Shiva's function as a fertility de deity, as a, as, a, as a moon god. And there in front of him, you can see there's a sacred fire with skulls around it, and he's, he's sitting on, on a it doesn't look like it in this picture, but what it actually is, it is a tiger skin. And these are all, that's a representation of a symbol of power. And that's showing his mastery over the animal world. Here's the Baba. Now this isn't a particularly good photograph, but I put it into this um, slideshow to, again, illustrate the arms and, and how it's restricted his motion. And just above his shoulder there, you can see Shiva and Shakti. The suicide gas is also known as Harish Chandragat. Basically, it's believed that a cremation by the Ganges can release itself from the cycle of death and rebirth from um, Samsara. Um, the god Pushan is asked to accept the sacrifice and guide the soul to its proper place in the afterlife. Uh, but there are rules as to what kinds of bodies are allowed to be burnt and, and, and not allowed to be burnt. So, unnatural deaths, such as those who commit suicide, uh, have killed other people or were murdered themselves or, were inv or who are involved in serious accidents, they, they're burned at this gat, at the suicide gat. Um, these victims of suicide and murder or other kinds of violence are essentially believed to have souls that won't rest. So no matter what's done with the corpse, even if they're burnt in the, um, in the holiest places uh, on the Ganges. What you're looking at is the site of where an Agori lives. Um, right in the middle of the suicide gap. You can see there, there is um, a sacred fire, uh, a trident of Shiva and his personal belongings and a little puppy there as well. So in terms of the rules of cremation, sadhus are never cremated because it's believed they are already pure. Therefore, they do not need purification by fire. This is him now. Um, he took a vow of silence, um, so he communicated with me via a notebook and his excellent English. Here you see he's covering himself with ash from the sacred fire. So if you remember earlier, we referred to the sacred fire as a duni. Um, so the original duni was ignited by Baba Kinaram from wood brought from the, crem the cremation ground uh, of the Ganges. And it is said to be the manifest presence of the fire god, Agni. The text describes the greatness of this uh, vibhuti, which is sacred ash, by, uh, by way of the story of the sage of Diversa. It is said that once on travel abroad, he heard the groans of the people in hell and began to look into hell. The sacred ash smeared on the sage's body fell on the suffering people in the form of dust particles. And even these particles brought their hellish torment to, to an end. Surprised at this, Yamraja, the god of death, went to Shiva. Accompanied by Brahma and Vishnu, Shiva told them that the particles of ash that fell into hell were all that was needed to ease their suffering. And this was the outcome. So that gives you an idea of how 
sacred this ash is, is believed to be. You can also see around um, this Sadhu's neck there is a, a chain of, um, of skulls right here, which again gives away his Shivaish um, beliefs. At the end of this um, display, when he covered himself in ash and did some yoga here, he asked me to um, buy him some charis as a donation. A uh, charis is, is a form of, of hash. Uh, but given this was a pretty fast way to end up getting sorted by the local police, I, I declined and, and gave him a cash donation instead. Um, he posed for me and gave me a blessing and covered my face in ash from the funeral pyre. Um, this wasn't the last time I got covered in, in cremation ash. Um, this is a, a, a man who's known to the uh, agori we just saw. Um, clearly you can see he's been smoking charis. So the difference between charis and hashish is hash is, is made from a dead cannabis plant and charis is made from a live one. So even at the peak of, of the uh, Indian crackdown on charis, it still remains, it was still very popular and remains so today, especially among kind of young professionals and Indian sadhus. The Naga sadhus, they're the naked sadhus you'll see walking around, agoris and tantric brahavara sects smoke it freely and really it's an integral part of their, their religious practice. Many smoke it in clay pipes called chillums and they use a cotton cloth to cover the smoking end of the chillum and insert kind of tightly packed pebble sized cone of clay as a, as a filter uh, under the chunk of charis before lighting the chillum and they, they walk and then chant many names of Shiva and veneration. So uh, this is a particularly stoned sadhu, the effects of charis. In the, the center of this shot, there's a body burning. Um, so it's a cremation pyre. So cremation is believed to release an individual's spiritual essence from its transitionary physical body, so it can be reborn. Um, fire is the chosen method of disposing uh, of bodies uh, because of its association with purification. And uh, it also has the power to scare, scare away harmful ghosts, demons, and evil spirits. So the bodies are taken for a purifying dip in the Ganga, the Ganges, um, and then the fire god Agni is asked to consume the physical body and release the soul towards heaven in preparation for rebirth. So what you're looking at here is um, a Dalit or an untouchable um, attending to a cremation pyre. Um, this particular type of Dalit or clan is known as a Dom. So what he's doing is he's throwing sandalwood dust on the part to hide the smell of, of burning hair. It takes roughly about 150 kilograms of wood to burn a human body in about two to three hours. The wood is generally a banyan or some other fast growing wood. Um, when a body is cremated, generally the man's chest does not fully burn and the woman's body, and with women's bodies, it's the hip bone that doesn't fully burn. After the body is burnt, uh, the attendant hits the ashes with a stick to release the hip bone or the what remains of the chest, chest from the ashes. A family member um, of the person being cremated uses two sticks to pick it up and throw the remains into the Ganges. You can see some water buffaloes there knocking about. Um, pregnant women carrying an innocent fetus inside are never cremated. Uh, young children uh, before the age of 12 are not cremated. People who die by cobra bites are not cremated because you cannot offer um, poison to the gods. Uh, incidentally, lepers are also not cremated because um, they're believed to have already purified. Uh, they have already been purified by their earthly sufferings. And you can see the hands and feet uh, of the individual burning here. Incidentally, there is a, a, a what's known as the electric uh, crematorium or the electric gat nearby, and this is where people can't afford to be burned on the actual banks of the Ganges get burned. Now, what's interesting is they, people will tell you uh, along the ghats that there's no smell when the bodies burn. And this is weirdly true, there, there really isn't. But there is a smell from the electric crematorium. And uh, there's quite a distinct and um, potent smell of pork, which is what the human body smells like when it burns. And right next door to uh, these cremation pyres, you've just got water buffaloes knocking about. Um, it's just kind of, it's a really kind of quite a chaotic scene. And this is the Shiva Shakti hybrid. 
So it's the it's the kind of dualistic state of Shiva and Shakti together as one. And right beside it, you've got the uh, Lingam Yoni with um, Vasuki, the Nagaraja. This is also known as the Shiva Linga, this particular shape, this one here. And this is the Shiva Shakta hybrid on Shiva Alagat, which obviously is named after Shiva. This man is another uh, Agori I met um, traveling around Varanasi. And to me, this man really felt like he'd achieved the Agor a sense of being. It was a huge sense of peace that resonated off this man. Uh, very, very gentle feeling. Well, some other Agori can give off a real air of, of, of menace, of, of aggression. There was no such feeling from this man. And here he is covering himself in cremation ash. This was directly from uh, an actual cremation. He showed me. In here, bits of bone um, in the billy tin he was carrying around with him. And here you can see him smearing the ash on his face. Incidentally, this is all with a 50 mil prime 1.4 cannon. I don't shoot cannon anymore, I shoot Nikon, but it's important to have a, a 50 mil. It is a stonking um, portrait lens. As you can see, the ash accumulating in the cracks of his skin here. The gas. So this is part of his Agor Sadhana. He's covering himself in cremation ash. He wears a simple loincloth. The material Agoris often choose to wear is often retrieved from bodies sunk in the Ganges. Again, this is the whole part of non-discrimination, whether it's a piece of silk or literally taken from a, a rotten body, they see it as being the same. And through the practice of doing this kind of um, ritualized behavior, they're looking to attain a spiritual knowledge, sadis. This man gave me a blessing as well, and this included, as you can probably yes. guess, a face full of ash. Um, he caught me by surprise, I really wasn't expecting when he did it. And um, I'd say I coughed and spluttered a bit, but it was it was okay. Um, this uh, cement skull you're looking at is from Babakina Ram Ashram, or Krem Kund as it's also known. So you saw these before at the start of the presentation. Um, these are the skulls of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. The skulls uh, represent this, the state of Abheda, which is non-discriminating cognition. It's saying, in effect, there's no difference between Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, or Mahesh. Um, depending on what you want to call them. All three are one and are depicted as three only in their functional aspect. Now, photography was banned inside the the, um, the ashram, so there was a limit to what I could get. The next section of this presentation takes us to Paro Leprosy Colony, or Shiri Shaveshwari Shamu. It was explained to me here that the temple uh, was founded in this particular ashram in 1961. And while its roots were in a gory and, and the gory way of, of being, they themselves said they had moved on into the modern world. And part of their development was moving from practices that were seen as abhorrent to working with the lowest of society, that being the lepers. With this in view, they started a service center in Aparo, Varanasi for the lepers in, in 1962. So this is on the other side of the bridge from the main city. So this uh, is part of the main treatment hospital you're looking at here. So the name of this place again is Shiri Shavashwari Shmu. Um, I think I'll pronounce that correctly. My pronunciation is pretty poor. Um, this place uh, again um, it was really, really remarkable because it showed this kind of weird manifestation of uh, of how a gory thought had gone full circle in the sense that it had moved away from kind of being absolutely apparent and being utterly perpendicular from traditional Hindi practices to going uh, that we will we will look after the lowest of society, the lepers. And it, I guess it's quite a Christian idea in a lot of ways and, uh, and care for them. Here we have a patient with partial leprosy of the foot making his way to the clinic for treatment. This is the Shiri Agashwar Bhagwan Ramji. Uh, he's the founder of this particular site. Uh, he's, he was considered a living saint during his lifetime and the last leader of the modern Agori. He would have been believed to have achieved Agorishwar, the apex of the Agor state. Um, 
so Agurishwar basically means Lord of, of Agor, a title of uh, Shiva in some of the scriptures. And, and this is how they would write about him. Um, in his eyes, nothing more is pure or impure because transcending duality, he realized the supreme unity. He becomes like a dried seed, unable to produce karma. So this is a, this is a quote that comes from um, some text about um, Ramji himself. And that's the interesting thing when we talk about ex escaping the wheel of life, samsara, being a dried seed, unable to produce karma, prevents the conditions of going into the, um, the wheel of life. This is a simple prayer that harks to the oneness of all things and that opposites are the same. It was written by this, the same individual, Ramji. I, Agorishwar, move freely everywhere in all times. I, Agorishwar, am present in the rays of the sun, in the rays of the moon, in molecules of air and in every drop of water. I, Agorishwar, am present in all beings of the earth, in trees and vines and flowers and in vegetation. I, Agorishwar, am present in every speck and every atom of space between the earth and the sky. I am in light and in darkness too. I have no form and, I'm, and I am formless too. I am in happiness and in sorrow too. I am in hope and in hopelessness too. I roam in past, present and future at the same time. I am noble and unknowable too. I am free and fettered too. You will find me in whichever form you search me with devotion as your ally. So that's all about dualistic nature of life and actually how the Agori are not seeing any difference between the different polarities within the, within, the, within the dualistic way of seeing the world. They see just oneness. It's all the same. It's all different aspects of the same thing. And at its very nature, it is the same. At its root nature, all things are one. This particular center op adopts an Ayurvedic system of treatment and received acknowledgement from the Guinness Book of Records. You can see the certificate there, for a world record for treating leprosy patients. With more than 99,000 patients registered with full leprosy and 147,000 with partial leprosy, um, all of which have been cured. The patients are treated for free and on recovery they're expected to serve in the kitchens to treat the current patients for a period of time uh, in return for their treatment. I particularly like this way of doing things because there's, there's no debt and there's no medical insurance required. It's just returning a depth of kindness, um, which I think is, is, is something we could really learn about. This is the men's ward. Um, this is a lone patient sitting on the floor. Um, I think he spilled some of his food on the floor in front of him. It was quite a humbling place to be and, and I find it, it was quite nerve wracking too. Um, you can see he's wearing a scarf around his face because um, the particles of leprosy are, are, are airborne in nasal droplets. The interesting thing about this treatment program is it's not only designed to heal the physical ailment, but also treat the mental and emotional damage suffered through leprosy, in that the patient is shown to be an important member of the community at the ashram, valued by their peers and the ashram members alike. And that helps to contribute to the well-being of the patients, well-being of everybody involved, really. Um, and that's why they get former patients to treat from the kitchen. They've got a unique perspective, having been patients themselves. This is the woman's ward. Now, on the left here is Dr. Ash Ashok Kumar, director of the Agor Research Institute. Um, who I quoted earlier on in this presentation, talking about the skull being a good prop. Um, now, in the um, in the bottom right of the frame, you can see there's Lord Ganesh, and he's in his Agore state because he's holding a skull, which brings me on to the skull ritual I witnessed. Um, the sadhu I witnessed do this is a uh, Shri Baba Chamunda Ram. It took a long time to find um, to find this man to actually witness a skull ritual. Um, and it really took me down the back streets of Varanasi, where my guides uh, knew of this tiny temple, Chamunda Temple. Um, pretty run down uh, area. It's a pretty run down area, and inside was this incredible place that was this mini 
Temple of Doom. As we arrived, he was doing a blessing for a young man, and we waited for 15, 20 minutes while he finished. And here were a row of three skulls, a clear mark of his gory heritage. And this picture is Baba Kina Ram, and he's surrounded by key figures in a gory history. He's obviously the biggest figure there. In front of uh, the sadhu, he had, he had this large notebook filled with mantras repeated. But the exercise of writing this mantra thousands and thousands of times was to generate power. And watch as, as Shava Sadhana would be. This is a type of Sadhana. By repeating this mantra, by writing it down, he could gain power. And this would help with everything from love to money to job promotions. And people would would come and donate to him to ask him to achieve these things for, to help them achieve these things. And there's the skulls. You can see there's a, a fairly um, withered garland around the skulls of cardamom and marigolds. And here's some old signs, and of course, with the Agori skull on it. Now, he what he's doing here is, is he's doing a rite with alcohol. Alcohol is a forbidden substance. It's seen as a polluting substance that brings the energy of tamas or destruction of energy to the fore. Alcohol is not seen as a, as a very good substance within the Hindu faith. In fact, it's it's very much banned. You're a bad Hindu if you drink. Um, but alcohol and drug use form the core to a huge amount of agori rituals. So here he is filling a small conch shell on a Shiva trident with whiskey. Here he drops some sugar in it, lights the sugar in the whiskey, puts it on a shelf. He's already moved the red skull. Um, the you can see the stripes across the skulls. And this is again, this is this is a Shiva symbol. The, the horizontal stripes represent Shiva. Now I I posed this question to the audience at uh, Treadwells. Um, the yellow and red dot that you see on the skull. Um, for some reason, my my fixers um, took particular exception to this. And were really quite nervous about it. Um, I made a pointed remark of telling me that's bad. The yellow and red is bad. Um, now I couldn't get any particular detail out, out of them as to why it was bad. Um, but an Indian gentleman who tended the presentation uh, at Treadwells was able to tell me that this represented essentially a spirit is trapped inside that skull. Um, more to the point, the spirit of the owner, the original owner of that skull, is trapped inside that skull. So it would have been some kind of Shava Sadhana um, that probably led to this situation. So meditation on corpse and then taking the skull from that corpse and seeing these as objects of power, of magical power. This is a skull cap. This is a separate skull. Uh, this is the skull that's going to be used for the ritual. That's the same skull cap and it's been filled with whiskey. Um, the tile in front, or uh, the, the tile behind the skull is uh, has a representation of Kali on it. So this is a puja for Kali. A dedication to her and uh, just in the foreground you can see there's a lot of um, limes and um, limes and chilies are often used as a, a kind of a good luck charm that you'll see in front of most Indian houses you'll see it kind of hanging from the door or above the door in most Indian houses and this is kind of it's a good luck charm but kind of more importantly it's like a kind of a Charm against the evil eye. It's to kind of scare away evil, and uh, it's, it's to scare away evil from the home and protect the inhabitants. It's a clearer look at the skulls, and there in the eye socket you can see is a, a creepy caterpillar having a walk around. And here is um, the sadhu's briefcase, and it's covered in the notebooks with the mantras written again and again, and that is a skull cap with some Bombay mix in it. It's literally, he's eating a snack out of the skull. Here's the skull from the shelf. At this stage, he's filled this with whiskey. In the background, in the bottom uh, right of the frame, you can see uh, it looks quite blurred. This is, that's actually the packet where the, the Bombay mix came from. 
So it's basically like he's taking crisps or chips and put it in the skull. He's preparing himself to drink the whiskey. There's about a, at least a pint of whiskey in this skull. And there he goes. Now he also mixed some oil in there and some water from the Ganges. Um, so I didn't drink any. Not that I actually objected to drinking whiskey out of a skull. Uh, it's the Ganges water, which I would have nothing to do with because it's um, it's so highly polluted. It would it would just be instantaneously serious health problems. So he's he's halfway through the whiskey now. He's starting to get a bit more erratic. I throughout the whole time he's chanting, all the time he's chanting. Different names of Shiva, slightly muttering under his breath. Um, so it's, it's, it's ritualized. It's a ritualized process. In the bottom left of the frame, there, um, there looks like it's a magic square. There's some sort of um, yantra. So it's this like a, so it's like a, a geometric shape that's used to represent uh, an intention, which would make sense if he's using a lot of mantras in, in, in books as well. He's calling Shiva's name, evoking him. Bowing to the skull. And you can see across his own forehead here the three horizontal lines of Ash from Shiva and the single use of the red on his forehead. So there's no yellow as well. It's not the same as the skulls. And he's finishing off the whiskey here. And he put his dreads up and he's uh, quite drunk. Pretty pleased with himself. Here's one of the dealer skulls. And that's me uh, examining one of the skulls. The skulls that he's just um, used. Well, it's not, it's not actually the skull he's used to drink of. It's the skull he had his arm resting on. And so in terms of why this is done, why people do this, why do the Agori do this? And what I believe they're trying to achieve is, in effect, they are trying to leave the world. So part of that process of deprogramming themselves is about destroying the material connection between the world and the self. So they see only oneness. That though that programming that ensures we see everything as separate, that we see everything as in categorizations is, is dissolved. And by completing utterly profane acts that's their road to, to starting that process by seeing that the conventions that define the world by breaking these conventions you break that programming and that's something they're looking to achieve and obviously how they have so a lot of these guys have profound experiences while while doing this and this last quote is is from Bhagwan uh, Ramji and um, this is the man who built the leprosy um on the leprosy hospital. Whatever is made and exists is devoured by time. Time does not spare anything or any being. Even the sky and the earth disintegrate over time. And why I think that quote is interesting and important is it illustrates the utter transience of everything, which is what the skull is symbolizing to the Agori. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that kind of uh, was a bit illuminating about um, the Agori and their practices.